All right, um, let's go ahead and get started, everybody. Um, welcome back to the Dharma Doors. Uh, I'm MC Owens. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Um, and tonight, tonight we are going to study, we're going to do a critical study of a Buddhist story. And so tonight we're going to be looking at a story from our sutra, which is the story of Bodhisattva loving deed and the maiden increasing virtue. <laughs> so it, we're going to look at this story that's coming from the sutra that we've been reading. I do, as usual, have a number of preliminary remarks to make before we dive kind of into the story and kind of start tearing it apart in that way. Um, I wanted to start tonight with um, sort of a, a, a general theme that we that I'm thinking about. And so what I mean is, is, you know, if you've if it's your first time to Dharma doors or you just have only been every now and then, I want to say sort of something about my approach to all of this Dharma stuff. I don't say this enough, um, but I'm a student just as much as all of you in that way. Yes, I teach. I am a teacher, but I have never stopped studying the Dharma. Um, and what I mean specifically is, as many of you know, I went to graduate school for Buddhist studies. I got all my degrees in Buddhist studies. I taught Buddhism as a professor in New York. And so my area that I was studying at in graduate school and sort of the area that I've continued to look at, I've been very interested in the emergence of what is called Vajrayana Buddhism. So the sort of, well, the more kind of advanced form of Buddhism that most people associate with Tibetan Buddhism, but it does this type of Buddhism, the Vajrayana, pops up all over the world, actually. And I've always been, since like my early days of graduate school, I've always been very curious about the transition Buddhism made to this kind of, well, to this Vajrayana. And so we're going to talk about that tonight, meaning we're going to talk about the transition of Buddhism to Vajrayana. But the reason why I'm mentioning that I'm a student is that I am, you know, I am ever always deeply engaged in this kind of research project. <laughs> and the research project is Buddhism, is the Dharma. But, you know, even before I went to graduate school, I had, I had read, you know, most of the mainstream, all of the mainstream books about Buddhism. Then when you, you know, you go to graduate school, you read everything. Now, I'm not saying I've read everything, not by a long shot, but I definitely felt and feel like I have exhausted a lot of the scholarship and a lot of the resources that are available regarding a lot of the topics that I'm interested in. And so I'm kind of just out here on my own, continuing the research project about early Vajrayana Buddhism and kind of what that's all about. And I'm telling you all of this because, as I've mentioned a few times, this collection of sutras, this uh, what's called the Ratnakuta or the Maharatnakuta collection, I've been teaching from this Sunday nights, San Francisco Dharma Collective. I've been teaching from this now for a long time. And the reason why I'm so interested in this particular collection of sutras is because, and if, if you don't know, this is a collection of 49 Buddhist sutras. And if you read all of these sutras, they really span a broad, like a broad area of Buddhism. And what I mean is, is that some of them, you would almost think that they were um, from the Pali canon. 
you would almost think that they were one of those early Buddhist sutras that you find in the Pali language. Most of the sutras are mainstream Mahayana Buddhism, Bodhisattva path, that's what they're all about. But then there are a few sutras though that I, I would consider them early Vajrayana. Like they're kind of like on the cusp. And the story that we're going to read, and in many ways, even the sutra that we've been looking at for the last few weeks or months, this sutra is sort of borderline Vajrayana. And I want to explore this story tonight from that point of view, um, kind of insofar as it kind of opens up, it opens up a lot of possibilities for or I should say it opens up a lot of possibilities that then become aspects of Vajrayana Buddhism. But before we get into that, I wanna back up because some of you might not be familiar with what this Vajrayana thing is all about. And so I just wanna take one quick step to remind us or inform us about some, some general ideas and then we're going to ooch our way forward to reading this very interesting story. Um, I guess the other thing before I leave this idea, though, of, of that I, of me being a student, I also want to make it very clear as we dive into this that tonight, especially, we are approaching this text in a in a very critical way. And what I mean to say is, is that you know, wh while while I am a Buddhist. I am definitely not a tantric Buddhist or a Vajrayana Buddhist. And in many ways, I'm not even really, especially the sutra we've been looking at, I'm not a huge um, fan of it. <laughs> like it wouldn't be my first sutra. And so what I mean to say is, is that in many ways, every Sunday night, you know, we're, we're studying these things. We're, we're looking at things, these things critically. We're reading these sutras critically. And I just kind of want to say to everybody that I, you know, I don't have any agenda in this. I'm not trying to push a certain kind of Buddhism over another kind of Buddhism. And I'm barely trying to push Buddhism, frankly. It's like, if, if you're into Buddhism, I'm, I'm here for you, but I'm not trying to like, you know, push it hard in that way. So really quickly again, if you haven't heard, and this will be interesting even if you have heard this. So there's this idea within the world of Buddhism. And the idea is called the three turnings of the Dharma wheel. And that rubric or that setup of these three movements of Buddhism you can understand it a few different ways, but I always like to divide this into like, you can think of these three turnings of the Dharma wheel in two different ways. If you're kind of an academic, scholarly, historically oriented person, then the way that you would think about these three types of Buddhism is that it's early or even archaic, arcane Buddhism, early Buddhism, corresponding to what is called Hinayana Buddhism, a kind of middle period Buddhism, and then a late period Buddhism. And what I mean by that is that if you're a scholar or academic or something like that, what you see when you look at the literature, when you look at the traditions, when you look at all of it, what a scholar sees is that around 500 BC or so in India, in the northeastern part of India, in what was called Magadha, there started this kind of ascetic cult, but an ascetic tradition around a founder, around a yogi called Siddhartha Shakyamuni, a Buddha. And that initial form of Buddhism was very monastic, very celibate. It was renunciatory, meaning you were homeless, basically living out in the woods, and you spent a life begging for food and meditating. 
And that was the practice. And it's in many ways not that different from a lot of other Indian ascetic traditions that were out in the woods, meditating, doing yoga, and all of that. Buddhism was one form of that. Fast forward a few hundred years. Now, the scholar, the historian, sees that the, in the lifetime of the Buddha, the Buddha started a meditation cult out in the woods, actually out, out in the um, mango groves. And then after a few hundred years, this tradition spread, spread south, even went to Sri Lanka, spread north, went to what today we call Pakistan and Afghanistan, even started spreading into Central Asia. And as it spread, Buddhism became seemingly, based on archaeological evidence and other evidence, Buddhism seems to have started to become very popular in certain kind of major, I wouldn't quite call them metropolises exactly, but like major cultural centers all throughout Northern India, Central Asia, and Southern southern india as well and in the cities not out in the mango groves but in the cities or around the major cities around 200 bc or so now if you remember that the buddha was 500 bc then we're talking about maybe 300 years of a mango grove dwelling meditation cult that became very, 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 very popular, spread all around. And then in these major kind of city areas, you started to get the emergence of a different kind of Buddhism. And that is what we would call Mahayana Buddhism. Again, if you're a scholar, you're seeing this as an emergence happening many hundred years after the Buddha died. And then that Mahayana Buddhism, and I'll have a little bit more to say about that in a second but that form of buddhism became very popular like really 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 popular the the more ascetic celibate form of buddhism the more monastic form was nowhere near as popular as mahayana buddhism became and so now that form of buddhism that we call mahayana buddhism started to become very popular, spreading even deeper into Asia, down East Asia. Now we're talking China, Japan, Mongolia, Korea. And then fast forward a few more hundred years, maybe to about 500 AD. So if the Buddha was 500 BC, 500 AD, we are now looking at about a thousand years after the lifetime of the Buddha in India, beginning in India, there was the emergence of a new form of Buddhism, a, a yet even newer form of Buddhism that becomes known as the Vajrayana. So now you have Hinayana, Mahayana, and then Vajrayana emerging again around 500 AD. And that form of Buddhism, well, I'm going to, again, I'm going to get into the more doctrinal differences here in a second, but that form of Buddhism, of course, is what spread to Tibet, and the entirety of Tibetan Buddhism is this Vajrayana form of Buddhism, but it also spread to China, Japan, Mongolia, and you find Vajrayana Buddhism in those places as well. In fact, you find Vajrayana even in Southeast Asia in uh, uh, Java, right, in certain parts of Indonesia, you find Vajrayana Buddhism. So my point is, is that a scholar, a historian, sees the three turnings of the Dharma wheel, the Hinayana, Mahayana, Vajrayana. A scholar sees that as a way of describing the cultural transitions and changes of Buddhism that happens over hundreds and hundreds of years. There is, and I want you to know this, there's another way of understanding the three turnings of the Dharma wheel. 
that way is you you would have to take off your scholarly hat and you would need to in a way become a buddhist believer because only buddhists believe what i'm about to tell you if you're a buddhist and kind of a certain kind of buddhist in terms of your faith and belief in the kind of historical figure of the buddha then your understanding of the three turnings of the dharma wheel are actually that the hinayana mahayana and vajrayana were all taught by the buddha during his lifetime 500 bc and he spent the first um 12 years or so there's different ways of breaking this down but some people say that the buddha spent the first part of his teaching career teaching the basics of the hinayana and then what they kind of say is is that there was a group of people who heard that message got all excited ran off into the woods or ran, ran off into the mango groves and they didn't stick around for the next part of the Buddha's teaching career, where he then advanced the teachings and introduced what is called the Mahayana. And then when everybody was ready, the Buddha finally taught the teachings of what are known as the Vajrayana. And so what I mean to say is that there's a whole other way of thinking about the three turnings of the Dharma wheel, which is that they occurred in, during the lifetime of the Buddha. And that basically certain groups took one message and ran with it, and they didn't stick around for the next message, and so on. So that's a way to understand the three turnings of the Dharma wheel. Now let's talk a little bit about the teachings that differentiate these three. And this is really what I wanted to get around to, to make sense of our text tonight. So there's so many things I could talk about, but I'm going to just zone in, hone in on one idea. The idea is, is that early Buddhism, the Hinayana, whether, you know, this was just the, the early teachings of the Buddha or early Buddhism. So I'm going to leave it up to you to decide which, which hat you, you are wearing, if you're kind of going with that more historical scholarly view or the more uh, faith-based view. But regardless, regardless, the teachings of the Hinayana are very dualistic and what i mean by that is is that the teachings of basic hinayana buddhism are founded on some very basic teachings around what are called good dharmas and bad dharmas kushala and akushalya or wholesome dharmas and not wholesome dharmas and so when it comes to being in the world, some things and some actions and some ways of thinking are wholesome, they're good, they're virtuous. Others are not. And in a way, the entire practice of early Buddhism is about increasing virtuous or wholesome dharmas, decreasing bad or unwholesome dharmas until you're only left with wholesome dharmas now i could focus on a lot of different dharmas and talk about whether they fall into the good category or the bad category but i'm just going to focus on the kind of elephant in the room because it's what the sutra is going to be talking about it's the idea of sexuality so I've already mentioned several times now, early Buddhism was a celibate tradition. Like that's what it, the Buddha was extolling. That's the, what the Buddha was suggesting. In fact, it's what the Buddha was demanding of anybody coming into the monastic Sangha. Celibacy was the name of the game. Now, there were other things, of course, regarding not stealing, begging for food 
and so on and so on. But one thing that really made a Buddhist a Buddhist in the Hinayana in the early days was whether you were celibate or not. And that's because in the early Buddhist tradition, sexuality and in particular sexual desire was definitely an unwholesome dharma. So we basically, the, the, again, the, the prescription of the Buddha was to stay away from it because it's bad. Now, the idea is, is that that duality between good and bad, wholesome and unwholesome, it, it continues to cut and run right through all of the early teachings. And it kind of can be mm, not summarized, but it can be understood, this duality it can be really clearly understood in terms of the duality between samsara and nirvana. So nirvana, nirvana is liberation, release, the cessation of suffering. So nirvana is the epitome of good in early Buddhism. Whereas being trapped in the cycle of birth, death, and rebirth, being trapped in samsara that's the worst in fact if you really get into like the the dogma or doctrine of early buddhism ultimately anything in the world anything in samsara is bad you don't want to have anything to do with samsara you know things like a job and rent and kids and mortgages and like anything having to do with samsara was considered basically bad anything having to do with nirvana like meditative states and tranquility and any of the things that get us to nirvana like the practices that's all good so again this is early buddhism that was kind of founded on this duality between samsara and nirvana and then insofar as samsara is the cycle of birth, death, and rebirth, <laughs> because the problem was all the birthing and rebirthing, sexuality was problematic like from the beginning because that was sort of the way that samsara kept going around and around was through sexuality and rebirths. So let's get away from that and again let's do everything possible and get to nirvana so that's the hinayana there's obviously a lot more to it than that and i'm setting this up in a certain way but then what happens is you get the rise of the mahayana and the mahayana the mahayana buddhist tradition although it is entirely Buddhism. It's entirely the teachings of early Buddhism. The practice, and I would even say the delivery of the teachings in the Mahayana, they change. And in some ways, they change quite a bit. Again, I could say a lot, but I'm just trying to focus on one idea. And that idea that is, is the idea is duality. And I want to talk about how the Mahayana tradition deals with duality. So in many ways, and, and this is sort of more my opinion, but it's, you know, it's an educated opinion in that sense. But it would seem from a lot of sutras I've read, from a lot of Mahayana text I've read, it would seem that the Mahayana tradition had a little bit of a problem with how dualistic early the early Hinayana was. And in fact, what we kind of start to get around to, and I'm going to try to summarize this e simply and easily, but one of the things that makes Mahayana Buddhism, the Mahayana Buddhist tradition, is that it is founded on a 
teaching that is from the early tradition, but it's this teaching that you know of as emptiness, shunyata. And there's something very interesting going on with the teaching of emptiness or shunyata, because emptiness is a statement about the nature, the actually it's a statement about the inherent nature of all these dharmas, whether they be called good or bad. Any phenomena, anything, according to this Mahayana Buddhist tradition, any dharma, anything, good or bad, actually lacks an inherent nature. It actually doesn't ultimately exist in any way that we think it does. And therefore, based upon this teaching of emptiness, the very kind of nature of dharmas, whether they're good or bad, it changes because of this teaching of emptiness. And what happens is, is that the Mahayana Buddhist tradition is much more of a tradition of what would be called Advaita, non-duality. Mahayana Buddhism is much more of a non-dual tradition. And it's founded on like teachings about non-duality. Now, he, but here's the thing about it though. This is how interesting it gets. You might've heard about teachings of non-duality, right? And the idea is, is that there are many traditions. In fact, I, I even mentioned the idea of Advaita, and there is a, in, an indigenous Indian philosophical tradition called Advaita Vedanta, which is this kind of non-dual philosophy. And of course, there's other traditions as well that espouse a type of non-duality. But here's the interesting thing about Mahayana Buddhism. So normally, if you were talking about non-duality, normally what you would be talking about, like in Advaita Vedanta, for example, if you're familiar with it, the idea is, is that there is this, like, what we would call the subject, object, whoop, not that object, this object. So the, the subject, object relationship, me and it, me and you, me and the computer, me and whatever it is. Again, it's what we call the subject-object relationship. The subject-object relationship is dualistic. And so most non-dual traditions are encouraging the dissolution of the subject-object relationship and then a kind of, well, a oneness, uh, a, a unit, not duality, a oneness, non-duality. And, you know, that sounds pretty good, but what's really interesting about Mahayana Buddhism and this teaching of emptiness is that they say, they recognize, and they say, hmm, non-duality. That sounds pretty dualistic to me. <laughs> <laughs> Meaning that just because you have set up this other idea of oneness and non-duality, your oneness and non-duality only makes sense relative to what we are calling non-duality. And so you haven't actually escaped duality. And so the teaching of emptiness is not actually even a teaching of non-duality, but it is a teaching about the emptiness of subject, the emptiness of object the emptiness of all phenomena, even if that phenomena is non-duality, empty as well. <laughs> so what I'm getting at is, is that this way of thinking, and I, you know, it's already 7.30, but I did my best. I did my best to, to try to summarize these basic ideas, moving from Hinayana to Mahayana, because now, if we understand a little bit 
of an idea of like emptiness and quote unquote non-duality, then we can understand how the Mahayana tradition, looking back on the Hinayana tradition, it recognizes that their obsession with pure and impure dharmas that that obsession was actually maintaining a dualistic state of mind. And so the Mahayana kind of moves to overcome that dualistic state of mind through the teaching of emptiness. But what we start to get into with this, though, is that a lot of the things that in early Buddhism were incredibly problematic, like sexuality, they they lose a little bit of their problem in Mahayana. And that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. And why I want to read this story is looking at the way that this story is dealing with sexuality. Now, if you've been coming to Dharma Doors the last few times, you'll know that this sutra that I'm reading, this one that is called the Upaya Sutra, it's the sutra about skillful means, there have been a bunch of stories or a bunch of part of this, parts of this that have been dealing with sexuality. And what we've actually been learning or hearing about is a certain sense in which a practitioner of Mahayana Buddhism, which we can simply call a bodhisattva for now, bodhisattvas are part of the Mahayana Buddhist path. And the idea is, is that what we've been hearing is, is that a bodhisattva, if their intentions are in the right place and they have compassion as the compassion for all sentient beings as their foremost driving force, what we're hearing or reading is that there's a way in which they may associate with sexuality in certain ways. But because their intentions are pure and because they have higher aspirations, what we've been hearing is, is that it's not kind of quote unquote, that big of a deal. <laughs> All right. That's, that's my terminology, by the way, but that's kind of the gist of what we're hearing is the language of the sutra, by the way, is that it's not a heavy transgression for a bodhisattva. They won't go to hell, right? If they maybe per partake of sexuality in this life, provided their intentions were in the right place, right? Okay, so that's sort of my opening remarks. I'll have a lot more to say about Vajrayana after the story, because again, the story is like what I'm calling an early Vajrayana uh, kind of situation. So let's, yeah, let me, I'll read this to you. I think it'll be interesting after what everything I just said. So if you have the good old yellow book, I'm on page 436. That's where this story begins. If you don't have the book, just kick back and relax. So, um, and again, if you haven't been coming, we're about mid, not even midway through, but we're, we're pretty far into this sutra right now. And a lot of other things have happened. And there was an event that just happened that also was about sexuality. And what we hear is, at that time, when, when the Buddha was giving that teaching, there was a bodhisattva named Priyamkara, loving deed, who was begging for food from door to door in the city of Shravasti, gradually approaching the home of an elder. The elder had a daughter named Increasing Virtue. Her name is, what is her name? Dakshina, Dakshina, Increasing Virtue, who lived in a high tower, <laughs> right? If this sounds like a, you know, one of those classic fairy tales. So the elder had a daughter named Increasing Virtue who lived in a high tower. The maiden took some food and went out towards Bodhisattva loving deed as soon as she heard his voice. 
when she saw the Bodhisattva, she became attached to his handsome appearance and his fine voice, and her passion was at once aroused. Burning with desire, she died on the spot, and her bones instantly disintegrated. Bodhisattva loving deed also had sensual craving for increasing virtue when he saw her. However, at that very moment, he thought, what is that? That is attachment. What is that eye of hers? What is this eye of mine? The eye is insensible by nature and is nothing but a lump of flesh. It neither loves nor knows. It neither thinks nor feels. It discriminates nothing and is empty by nature. The same is true of the ears, the nose, the tongue, the body, and the mind. He contemplated membranes, skin, blood, flesh, fat, hair, pores, nails, teeth, bones, marrow, sinews, and veins. He contemplated everything from head to foot and found that no part of the body, internal or external, is worthy of craving, worthy of attachment, worthy of aversion or delusion. When he had correctly observed all these dharmas, he was freed from desire and instantly achieved the realization of the non-arising of all dharmas. Overwhelmed with joy, he ascended into the air, the height of a palm tree, and circled the city of Shravasti seven times. When the Buddha, the world honored one, saw Bodhisattva loving deed flying unhindered in the air like a king of swans, he asked the young Ananda, Ananda, do you see Bodhisattva loving deed flying unhindered in the air like a king of swans? <laughs> Ananda, Ananda answered, I, yes, I do. The Buddha told Ananda, Bodhisattva loving deed contemplated the dharmas when his carnal desire had been aroused. And at that moment, he defeated Mara. He will turn the dharma wheel in the future. Now, increasing virtue, Dakshina, the maiden increasing virtue, she was immediately reborn after dying in the heaven of the 33. And suddenly she found herself living in a palace made of the seven treasures, 12 leagues square. She was attended by 14,000 celestial maidens. And by the way, she'd been transformed into a male. Knowing his, her, knowing her previous life, the Deva Putra increasing virtue. So the godling, the, the god child increasing virtue investigated her past karma, asking herself, what karma caused my rebirth in this place? Then she remembered that she had been the daughter of an elder in Shravasti whose carnal desire had been aroused upon seeing the bodhisattva loving deed. With her desire raging, she had died immediately and changed from a female into a male. Because of this event, she had acquired vast miraculous powers. Then Devaputra, increasing virtue, thought, huh, I received this result of a god's body in a, in a palace in the 33 heavens, I received this result because of my carnal desire 
for bodhisattva loving deed. What if I were to make offerings and pay respect to him? What then? It's not fitting for me to enjoy the five sensual pleasures here before making offerings to him. And so with this resolution, she, she decided to go to see the Buddha and the Bodhisattva loving deed in order to pay homage and make offerings to them. Therefore, at nightfall, she and her retinue, or he and his retinue, came to the place where the Buddha was staying, bearing celestial fragrant flowers, perfumed ointments, and powdered incense, illuminating the entire Jetta Grove with the lights of her own body. They approached the World Honored One and Bodhisattva Loving Deed. They offered the Buddha the celestial flowers, the perfumed ointments, and the powdered incenses, bowed down with their heads at the Buddha's feet, made three circumambulations to the right of the Buddha and Bodhisattva Loving Deed and the assembly, and joined their palms toward the Buddha. Okay, so there's more, but I'm going to pause there because I want to make sure we can talk before I... Um, I don't want to just read all night in that way. So that's the, the gist of the story there, right? So we've got Bodhisattva loving deed and the young maiden in the tower increasing virtue. They are both attracted to each other. They both have this carnal desire for one another. Unfortunately, increasing virtue dies immediately from her burning desire. Whereas we hear this, you know, this paragraph about where the Bodhisattva loving deed, he, he becomes aroused, but then says, whoa, what's that? And then proceeds to basically walk through a very classic Hinayana meditation on the body. So all of this, this language about that the, the eye is insensate, it's just a lump of flesh, a lump of blood, and all of that, that's a very common Hinayana standard Buddhist kind of practice. And it is indeed, actually, if you're not aware, there is a lot of Hinayana practices, the early form of Buddhism, that basically in order to combat sexual desire, the Buddha recommends whoever you're attracted to, just remember they're going to be a corpse someday. And you can see them as just blood, flesh, and bones decaying. And if you kind of tap into that reality that they are actually just a decaying body of flesh, they cease to be as attractive and it becomes a technique for getting rid of your sexual desire. Now, remember what I said, early Buddhism was definitely, it was like sexuality was a bad dharma. And so this was a technique to get rid of that bad dharma. Now, Bodhisattva loving deed gets aroused, does this meditation on the body and all of that. By the way, they do, they do throw in though, that little Mahayana, uh, extension of the teaching where the bodhisattva also realizes that all those dharmas of eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and mind are empty. You don't really hear that in so much in the Hinayana. So this is this Mahayana adaptation of that. And then he has this great realization of the birthlessness or non-arising of phenomena. Levitates in the air, goes flying around. Meanwhile, our increasing virtue dies and is reborn as a god in a palace and all of that. Now, what you probably picked up on, but I want to kind of reinforce it if you didn't catch it, both of these bodhisattvas, or I should say because the um, increasing virtue is not called a bodhisattva, just called a, a deva putra. But what we want to notice is, is that both of these characters, both of these people, something good came out of 
their carnal desire. That is the message that we hear. And by the way, you know, there's this version of the sutra too. This is the translation from uh, some Tibetan versions. So it's very similar. Um, of course, it's the same sutra. But I wanted to focus on, for a moment, I want to focus on the line that the, the God, Increasing Virtue, says. And I want to read you this version. She says, so she's looking around, and then she does this uh, past life recollection, right, where she's wondering, like, wow, how did, how did I become reborn as a God in a celestial palace? So she reflects and goes, oh, yeah, it was because I got turned on by Bodhisattva loving deed. And then she says this thing, if, if this is the reward for thoughts of lust, what would be my reward for doing prostrations and paying homage to the Bodhisattva loving deed? And that's where she gets all of her retinue and goes to the Buddha and loving deed and makes offerings. So again, interestingly, both of these characters make advances via their lust. And this is what I want to kind of draw our attention to as this is a part of the Vajrayana path. So a big part of the Vajrayana path. Now, I, I just want to cut this one off ahead of time. You may know about Vajrayana or Tantric Buddhism. You might have heard about it because of Tantric sex. And that idea of what, you know, the yabyum, the kind of male and female uh, in coitus, right? These image. I don't actually have an image. Oh, I do. One second. I have a book. I have a book with... But if you're familiar with that image of the Yabyum, so that is a Buddha or a Bodhisattva, depending on who you ask, with consort, and they are together. So, you know, this is a good book, by the way, about Vajrayana Buddhism by Reginald A. Ray. But this, of course, is like an icon image of the Vajrayana path, the male and the female Yabyum. So, that's full on Vajrayana Buddhism. What we're looking at here is, is like the kind of these little, these little seeds in Mahayana Buddhism that turn into aspects of Vajrayana Buddhism. So that idea of not only is, so what I'm getting at is, is not only is this sutra not going like full Hinayana, where the lust of these two people was their downfall. That's would be the Hinayana story is about how both of these people went to hell and had to start all over because they had desire for each other. It's not Hinayana. And there's a lot of wonderful Mahayana sutras that I really enjoy where they, well, ultimately, they apply the teaching of emptiness to distinctions between the sexes. And so eventually, through the teaching of emptiness, you arrive at this very powerful, important teaching, which is that a Buddha is neither male nor female. In the Hinayana, no, 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 no. Buddhas are male, period. <laughs> In the Mahayana, you literally get it said, oh, no, 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 no. Buddhas are non-dual. They're beyond duality. So how could they be male or female? Doesn't make any sense. So there's that where there's Hinayana, where having any kind of lust is totally bad. There's mainstream emptiness Mahayana, where we're not even really talking about sexuality as being good or bad. And now here we have it where lust on both of these people's part is not bad, is not totally super empty and neutral, but is actually a propellant, a propelling force in their spiritual maturation. 
And that is an aspect of the Vajrayana path. Now, again, I, it's why I started by saying I'm a student of all of this. I am not a Vajrayana teacher. So please take everything I'm saying as coming from a, a, you know, a scholarly, nerdy historian guy. But as I understand it, a lot of the practices, and of course, I've done retreats and all of that. So this is also first-hand experience. But one of the things that the Vajrayana does is it basically has techniques for harnessing a kind of energy of these things that would in the Hinayana be considered bad. And rather than sort of, well, basically rather than repressing them in some sort of way that the, like, and this can happen with a lot of monasticism, it becomes a form of sexual repression. So rather than repressing it and kind of rather than just like emptying it out completely as a bodhisattva kind of would do in that emptiness way, the Vajrayana is like, why don't we use this, these tendencies and the energy and the power of them? And so rather than suppress that energy, let's harness it and utilize it to propel us to enlightenment. Now, one of the things that I want to say that I, I, you know, I believe in as far as my understanding of Vajrayana, Vajrayana Buddhism, that type of Buddhism is always done in a, um, in a system of tutelage. So a, a guru student kind of a way, and it's a, in, an essential part of the practice that you have guidance from an enlightened master because it is way too easy for somebody let's say let's say you're a very um you know kind of sexual person in that way if if you are like but i'm i'm suffering though i have so much anxiety i have so much stress oh Buddhism is a tradition for alleviating dukkha, for alleviating suffering, stress, and anxiety. I want to alleviate my stress and anxiety. What do you got? Now, if that person were just, they were left to their own, you know, druthers, as they say, and you told them, well, there's this form of Buddhism, and you definitely can't have sex in that form of Buddhism. It's bad, right? And then there's this form of Buddhism where they just, they're in some emptiness trip and it's kind of hard to understand. If they hear that there's this other kind of Buddhism that allows sexuality, which of those three do you think this person's going to choose? Now, my point is, is that these teachings that are going to harness your desire, harness your sexuality, and by the way, it's not just sexuality. There's techniques for taking whatever your desires are and transmuting them, sublimating them to enlightened practice. But my point is, is that without a master guiding us, knowing where we're at, we cannot decide of our own. <laughs> oh, then I'll just do that practice where I get to, you know, stare at naked ladies or whatever. <laughs> like, so my point is, is that this sexuality stuff in the Vajrayana needs to be um, really appreciated, like as a technique. Now, I do kind of want to mention a few other things, but any questions, comments, answers, ideas so far about, because I know I've been going on for a while, a, a little too long. <laughs> okay. So let me, I'm going to take a, a step back because I want to address something else. And I, I need to do this now because the clock is ticking. So there's one way to read this sutra and this story. One way to read it is as if it were a historical document about two people from the life of time of the Buddha, because the Buddha is also in this sutra. So one way to read this is literally, that this is a literal story, or not even a story. It's a literal re 
account of what happened to two people. I wouldn't read it that way. I don't think you're inclined to read it that way, given people levitating the height of palm trees and all of that. It, it sounds allegorical to me. And every, as everybody knows that comes to Dharma doors, I read these things allegorically. So let's dispense with the idea that this was an actual event. <laughs> and we could read it then allegorically, which is the way that I would normally do it. Now, but what I want to get to, though, is this. If we were to read it allegorically, then we would sort of put ourselves either in the position of increasing virtue or in the position of the bodhisattva loving deed, meaning that as practitioners, if we are practitioners and we hear an allegorical story, it's usual, it's a common thing to then assume the position of one of the people in the story and say, okay, well, what can I, you know, oh, you mean, you mean the next time I have a, a attachment to lust, I should think, what is this I? What is that I? Like, that's one way you could do this is using this as a prescription for practice. But I'm going to take a different uh, approach tonight. And I want to approach this. Um, I, I Again, I want to really want to focus on, it's like I'm hyper-focused on this line where increasing virtue has this thought of, wow, if this is what I get, if this is the reward for thoughts of lust, what would my reward be for making prostrations, right? So at that point, what I want us to think about is, as you may know, in the world of Buddhism, you have the idea of a bodhisattva as you or me, as anyone, as anyone who has made the bodhisattva vow, so this vow to awaken all sentient beings, there's an idea that, you know, if you make the vow or, you know, you're practicing Mahayana Buddhism in that way, you're a bodhisattva. So we can think about it that way. But as you also may know, there are these kind of um, famous bodhisattvas, you know, Avilokiteshvara, Manjushri, Samantabhadra, you know, the like the famous bodhisattvas that you might get a statue of, or that you might have a painting of. And so what I'm getting at is, is that yes, bodhisattvas are me and you and, you know, altruistic people looking out for all sentient beings. Yes, those are bodhisattvas. But then you also have these, like, uh, basically what my, my notes here say that I wrote a little while ago is, it's about the bodhisattva as an icon or as an idol. And what I want you to kind of now be thinking about is this, this line here that the, the rewards of having lustful thoughts for the bodhisattva, that there's, there's rewards for having lustful thoughts. So what are the rewards for making offerings and and kind of honoring in that way, right? Now, ultimately, what's the reward for that is going to be that increasing virtue is going to receive the prediction of enlightenment, that she's going to eventually become a fully enlightened Buddha from making offerings to the Bodhisattva loving deed in that way. But my point again is, is that if we read this sort of as an early Vajrayana text, it's talking about these kind of, um, well, interesting ways of having relationships with bodhisattvas. And I don't mean, you know, again, uh, living bodhisattvas, but bodhisattva ideals, if you will, or images or icons or things like that. So, everybody with me? 
Cool. So actually, let me get to that part. And that way we can kind of finish this story out. So the God increasing virtue has now come over to where the Buddha and the Bodhisattva loving deed are. She's made her offerings and circumambulated and prostrated. And then she recites a poem. And what she says is, inconceivable is the honored one among gods and humans. Inconceivable are the deeds of bodhisattvas. The dharma of the Tathagata is inconceivable, as is the renowned one himself. In my previous life in Shravasti, I was an elder's daughter named Increasing Virtue. I was young and pretty then, cherished and protected by my parents. We never jested at the Tathagata, the world honored one. One day, a Buddha Putra, a child of the Buddha, loving deed, who had great awesome virtue, approached my father's house while begging for food in Shravasti. I was filled with great joy when I heard his fine voice. At once, I took some food and went out toward Bodhisattva loving deed, loving deed, child of the Buddha, and cultivator of the great mind. When I found the Bodhisattva so handsome, how, so handsome and elegant, my mind was defiled with desire for him. I thought, if my desire is not fulfilled, I shall die instantly. I could not utter a word then, nor could I give the Bodhisattva food that I held in my hand, for the depths of my heart were burning with aroused carnal desire. My body was inflamed with heat, and thereupon I died. Within the, span, within the span of a flash of thought, after my death, I was born in the heaven of the 33, changed from a lowly girl into a male god praised by mankind. A superb, wonderful palace spontaneously appeared, full of marvelous precious treasures. 14,000 beautiful maidens became my retinue. This event prompted me to examine my past lives at once by contemplation in solitude. Then I knew the reason for my rebirth. It was the result of my carnal desire. Because I had gazed at Bodhisattva loving deed with a passionate mind. Because I saw the Bodhisattva, I obtained the light of joy. The bright flames now radiating from my body are caused by that karma of carnal desire. Even carnal desire for a bodhisattva can produce such a blissful result, let alone making offerings to them with a virtuous mind. I do not wish to seek the Hinayana. What I want, only the Buddha can tell. Now, in the presence of the world honored one, I vow to seek all-knowing wisdom. I will not regress in pursuing Buddha wisdom even if I must, suffer, must practice for kulpas as numerous as the sands of the Ganges River. I have met a good friend, Bodhisattva loving deed. Now I want to make true offerings to him. Only one offering is true, to bring forth bodhicitta, the vow for enlightenment, and to cultivate bodhi, that is the supreme, most venerated deed. I will never look at women with lust again and wish to be forever free from a female body thereby. I say this to the Buddha, who has the four fearlessnesses. When my parents found me dead and rotten, they wept with much grief and they said, it was due to monk loving deed. Complaining and crying, they scolded the monk loving deed. Then the Buddha, by his miraculous power, caused the God, increasing virtue, to go up or to go to upbraid or uh, reprimand his former parents and admonish them not to blame the monk loving deed, lest they should undergo sufferings in the long night of ignorance. So increasing virtue did so, saying to the parents, 
Your daughter, increasing virtue, has been reborn in the heaven of the 33. She has the body of a god with a light shining far and wide. Now you, her former parents, should go to the world honored one and repent your maliciousness. Okay, I'm going to skip a little bit of this for time's sake because I still have a few things to say. All right, so what happens is, is at the end of this, the Buddha tells Ananda. Ananda is kind of like, whoa, what's going on here? So the Buddha tells Ananda, listen close, heed my words. The bodhisattva acts or practices that I speak of are inconceivable. With unexcelled wisdom and, and upaya, bodhisattva loving deed often makes this vow. If a woman is seized with lust when she sees me, she shall change into a male at once and win others' respect. Ananda, you see how wonderful is the power of this virtue. If an ordinary person performs a misdeed, they will fall into miserable planes of existence. But if a courageous one, a bodhisattva does it, they can defeat Mara thereby and cause others to be born in the heavens of gods. All right, so right there we have it kind of once again, this idea that if ordinary people with an ordinary mind do these things, it's conceivable, not inconceivable, but they will, it's a misdeed and they're gonna kind of suffer the karmic consequences. But this idea that, but if a courageous bodhisattva does it, they can defeat Mara thereby. That's what I'm talking about. That's the kind of Vajrayana ethos right there. That in the Hinayana, and yeah, let me make sure everybody's on the same page about this too. So if you don't know Mara, because I know not everybody knows all the Buddhist mythology, you know, Mara is an interesting figure in the world of Buddhism. Mara, that word, like the name Mara, means death. And basically, Mara in the Buddhist tradition is the personification of death, the specter of death that haunts every sentient being, goading them into fear, goading them into states of panic. That's Mara. So your, our fear of dying, the Buddhists call that Mara. Now, if I told you that, if I put it that way, that Mara is this personification of death and Mara is this fear of dying that all people have, even all sentient beings are, again, their actions are prompted by a fear of dying. So that's Mara. If I told you that, then doesn't it make sense or isn't it so simple to understand that a Buddha sits under the Bodhi tree and defeats Mara? What would it mean to defeat Mara? It would mean overcoming the fear of death and dying. That is how I understand Buddhism. That's how I understand dukkha, suffering, it's fear and terror of dying and to defeat Mara is to overcome that. So defeating Mara is kind of what the, that's the Buddhist enterprise. In the Hinayana, we could defeat Mara through pure action, through pure dharmas, by cultivating all the pure dharmas. Mara loves all the impure dharmas. That's, that's the Hinayana view. Mara loves it when you participate in the impure dharmas. Mara hates it when you participate in only pure dharmas. And so you can defeat Mara in Hinayana by pure dharmas. In the Mahayana, 
you defeat Mara with wisdom. And if you can understand emptiness, you can definitely defeat Mara. And it actually, that's a direct express route to the defeating of Mara is through wisdom. But what we just heard is that a courageous Bodhisattva can actually defeat Mara by way of things even like lust. And again, that's an aspect of this third turning of the dharma wheel it's this aspect of vajrayana buddhism again rather than suppressing those feelings we sort of i i guess the way that i think of it is if you have some sort of um you know a, a desire it doesn't have to be sexual desire by the way but just something that is then an attachment something that you're clinging to and if you understand the Dharma, meaning the Four Noble Truths, and you understand that that clinging or that attachment, that's kind of the source of dukkha in that way. The idea is, is that in the Hinayana, again, if, if this is it, like, let's say uh, hot, you know, whatever it is, hot lemon water, if that's my desire, like, ah, then I should probably go away. <laughs> And I go into a, a cave and meditate and try to forget about that which I wanted in that way. The Vajrayana, though, rather than moving away from that, the way that I think of it is that it's actually going like right through it. And I don't mean, by the way, I actually, I don't mean having sex. I don't mean that. Now, in certain, in some certain branches of Vajrayana Tantric Buddhism, there is actual ritualized sexual practices. But I'm that's like some really later advanced, like Vajrayana stuff. What I'm talking about is more of actually a kind of, you could imagine it as a meditative mind st state in which rather than, so let's say you're having a problem with a certain desire that keeps arising in the mind. In the Hinayana, again, as it arose, you would really be wanting it to just go away. And, you know, there's some more forceful techniques of making that go away and there's uh more gentle techniques for making that go away but you ultimately want it to go away so what i'm talking about is techniques and practices of visualization and meditation in which when those things arise you almost encourage its arising to really encounter it and in a way through that kind of uh the the depth of that exposure you can kind of come out the other side in that way now again this does turn into people actually having sex as a form of practice but again i'm not even talking about that i'm talking about just this interesting twist of rather than running away from sexuality we are sort of actually kind of using it or harnessing it in that sense so All right, questions, comments, answers, ideas? Yeah, Tanya. I can't hear you, but I want to. Oh, maybe that's me or no. Oh. There we go, okay, yeah. thanks. Um, yeah, so I was thinking about the transmutation of the energy stuff that you were talking about. And just sort of generally, because my understanding is like you said, it could be for like anger, or it could be for anything. It could be sexual desire, anger, and any sort of afflictive emotion. And so I've heard people talk about it. Like, it's like, you know, there's an energy that comes up with that. And then when you have that afflictive emotion come up or that thing come up, and then I was just thinking maybe like once you see the emptiness of it, you're still, the energy is still there and then you transmute it into something else. Is that kind of like your understanding of it? So you, you have to have maybe some sort of a reactivity toward whatever's happening. 
um, in some way to have sort of an energetic response. You see it as empty and then the energy is left and then you, you can direct it to something else. Is that kind of like what it's? Yeah. It, 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 it's, it's probably more complicated than that, but. <laughs> it's way more complicated than that. I was going to say that I'm speaking in very broad generalizations about, you know, just in many ways, I'm really just talking about how Early Buddhism is very puritanical, very anti-sex. <laughs> Vajrayana, not so anti-sex. And and what I kind of would like you to, you know, um, walk away from this Dharma talk kind of thinking about, and, and Tanya, the way that you put your question, you, you took the words right out of my mouth. It's about understanding that you actually are, we are not, jumping right from puritanical Hinayana to this more liberal Vajrayana, it all takes place through the Mahayana teaching of emptiness. None of this works if you don't understand the teaching of emptiness. And there's a lot of reasons that it's too late for me to get into about why that is, but you really need to have gone through the emptying process and really coming to that understanding that what I'm calling a good dharma and what I'm calling a bad dharma, that those are totally relative ideas. And therefore, those ideas don't have any svabhava, don't have any inherent nature. So we've already sort of taken the oomph out of both, actually, pure and impure dharmas. And this is where, of course, if, and I didn't say this earlier, in the Hinayana, it's like samsara is hell. <laughs> nirvana is basically the new heaven. So get out of samsara, get to nirvana. But the whole Mahayana tradition, especially the bodhisattva path, bodhisattvas are not going to nirvana. Well, I mean, they are in some kind of grand sense, but my point is, is that regarding the, the nirvana samsara divide, you know, the Mahayana, when in talking about the bodhisattva, a classic, classic description of a bodhisattva is a bodhisattva is one that abides neither in samsara nor nirvana but as actually a kind of a, a bridge that takes people out of samsara to nirvana, but they themselves are not in either. So that's very much that kind of mainstream Mahayana view where the bodhisattva is abiding in neither samsara nor nirvana, abiding in neither impure dharmas nor pure dharmas. They're all empty. So the bodhisattva is in that zone. And what we've actually been reading, and this gives me an opportunity to return to the sutra as a whole, what we've been reading is, is that if a bodhisattva is genuinely, honestly, truly out of samsara, they, they're done. They don't want to have anything more to do with this ridiculous world in that way. But they're also not just drifting off into the bliss of meditation and nirvana. They're like deeply concerned about all sentient beings. But because the bodhisattva is transcendent of samsara, not in nirvana, they now are opened up to this possibility of what is called upaya, skillful means. And because they're not in either camp, they can utilize either camp, provided that it fulfills their upayak uh, their upayak desire to rescue and awaken sentient beings, and that's where we get all these stories about these bodhisattvas seemingly transgressing rules about sexuality, but only because they had this higher desire for liberating sentient beings. So. Yeah, Noe. There we go. Uh, thank you, Michael. Oh, thank you, Michael. So 
the the last group, the, the Hinayana, the Mahayana, and the Vajrayana, which mm -hmm. is what's the, their perception of. It's my understanding that they can achieve enlightenment in this world. Yes, or this yeah. lifetime. In this lifetime, there's a difference in 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 the Mahayana enlightenment. We're, we're bypassing. We're just letting it go, so that others can, you know, the the Bodhisattva path. Someday, enlightenment is a practice. I, I'm doing it now. One perspective, and then the Hinayana was just getting to Nirvana right now. Nirvana, Nirvana, just going away. Is that correct? It was sort of on the track there. Yeah, yeah. And I'll I'll just sort of fill it, uh, fill out a few things, but that's the basic Good. idea. Yeah. So I think with those perspectives, it also changes what you just read because uh, they're all three are going to take it differently. They're all the same, but they're going to take it differently. If I can achieve enlightenment in this life through practices of chanting and whatever mudras and all of these things, and I go into that world, which I have the option of doing as a human being, um, or I can put it off <laughs> in the Hinayana or in the Mahayana, or I can just sit by myself and obtain it Narbonne at this moment. Look, so go ahead and fill it in. I'm just talking oh, here, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just, because um, I didn't quite mention it in my opening about the three, the three turnings or also the three vehicles. <clears throat> so an important thing to remember just to round out this Dharma talk, in the Hinayana, there, the goal, if you will, is nirvana, but specifically, there's this idea of the goal is the state of being an arahat who is in nirvana. But again, nirvana is not a place, nirvana is the cessation of the affliction, so no greed, no anger, no delusion in an arahat. But one of the things that I always like to make clear is that the Hinayana has a certain understanding of karma and that basically the only like basically they they it's kind of just a path of what is called individual liberation because the only karma I can affect is my own. And so there's this idea that that the reason why the practice is so focused on the individual is because the understanding is that's all that can be done. And so that's one thing. And then also an arhat is not a Buddha. Arhats are followers of Buddhas, students of Buddhas. A bodhisattva in the Mahayana, though, is on their way to becoming a Buddha, not an arhat but a Buddha, and that's a different project altogether to become a Buddha. But part of what makes the Mahayana the Mahayana is that they don't believe in individual liberation. They do believe that I, Michael, can affect your awakening. And insofar as I can somehow affect your awakening, I should <laughs> in that sense, like that's part of the, the practice. And in the Mahayana regarding the Bodhisattva becoming a Buddha, they usually say that it takes about three incalculable eons for a Bodhisattva to, to fully become a Buddha. So in the Hinayana, you can't become a Buddha. In the Mahayana, it's gonna take you three incalculable eons. And then yes, Noe, in the Vajrayana, one of the selling points of Vajrayana Buddhism is they say, we can get you to Buddhahood in this lifetime. And the way that we can do that is through these fancy techniques of harnessing your various desires and expediting this process, rather than the very long process of sort of slowly weeding them out in that way. So, so. That is a, a, an important distinction to make in that sense. Yep. All right. I think uh, that's about, uh, I did, 
Okay, I'm not going to go in because it's late, but I did want to I did want to say something about there is in this sutra. It's one of the reasons why I'm not crazy about this particular sutra. There is this mm, it's kind of a Well, here's the thing about it. <laughs> what it is is I wanted to address the thing that comes up sometimes in these sutras about the females turning to male. Now, here's the thing about that. We need to appreciate that in the Hinayana, women don't stand a chance. <laughs> like, meaning you could be the best nun on the planet in, in a Hinayana, a Theravada tradition. You could be the best nun on, a, on the planet and you're still below the worst monk on the planet. <laughs> and to, as you know, wild as an idea as that is, that is an actual kind of thing about the Hinayana, that women sort of were nowhere in this. Now, in the Mahayana, the thing about it is, is that and and there's I could I have done Dharma talks about this, so I'm not going to go deep into it right now, but there's a way in which if you kind of know your history and know everything, there's a way in which all of this business about the women turning to men and then becoming Buddhas is actually incredibly progressive. Now, for us, it still seems very retro, very retrogressive because of this idea of like, wait, they got to become men. But I want you to appreciate that the, the opening the doorway to the possibility back then is important but then let's not forget that there are wonderful wonderful sutras that uh, that don't do that where there's we actually have female figures that i'm thinking of course of the wonderful vimalakirti sutra where the female figure is told by the male figure well you got to turn yourself into a man first and she says, why don't you turn yourself into a woman first? <laughs> and it's one of the most radical moments in a Buddhist sutra where they, they take this idea of the, the necessity of transitioning from female to male and flip it entirely on their head. And then there's even other Mahayana sutras, like I said, that are much more explicit about how Buddhahood is non-dual beyond the distinctions of male and female. And so you know so i wanted to address that this is kind of one of those more quasi retrogressive ones where the female needs to turn into a male but again if you read it the right way or if you look at it the right way the fact that she got reborn as a god in a heavenly realm is like whoa that's a you can see that as a good thing not this sort of deference to whatever patriarchy or something like that. So, all right. But once again, I have said more about that male female thing in other Dharma talks, uh, and I will probably have more to say about it in the future. So, <laughs> all right, everybody. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Having a good time. <laughs>